Commodore, it's great to have you here. Thank you for joining me on Go Bold. Um, can you talk to me about the significance of the Halifax class frigates and what it means to the Navy, the capability that it brings? Well, a frigate's really a general purpose, especially the Halifax class. It's the foundational part of our Navy. It's the general purpose, uh, purpose surface combatant that really allows us uh, the range, the distance, and the, uh, the, the uh, capacity to uh, project force. Uh, either in Defense of Canada at home or uh, abroad. So really, it is the core of what our Navy is when it comes to uh, combat capability. Awesome. And what type of... Uh, th there's a number of types of capabilities that the, that the frigate brings to the Navy in terms of combat power, kinetic uh, effect. Uh, can you describe some of those things? Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, our frigates were built in the uh, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s design. They have an anti-surface, uh, subsurface and anti-air capability, and it's a closer in anti-air and not an area air defense. Recently in their upgrades, we've also put in uh, some higher end capability and signals intelligence, command and control in some of them, and they bring with them a very capable helicopter that has uh, ASW and anti-surface capability. So overall, they make a fairly good bubble uh, to project power. Uh, as it compared to uh, many other frigates in the world and we're able to do uh, a bit of command and control at sea out of some of our frigates as well to manage uh, several other ships. So uh, like I said, it's a really important building block. And um, talk to me about the numbers of ships that the Royal Canadian Navy has in terms of frigates, uh, both on the east and west coast and, uh, and you know, what's kind of their endurance and, and uh, yeah, how long can they be out at sea before they need to come back and replenish? Well, we have uh, 12 uh, Canadian patrol frigates right now, and uh, we have seven on the east coast and five based on the west coast. And we're actually deploying sort of uh, west coast ships have gone east before. East coast ships are going west now to uh, increase presence in the Indo-Asian uh, Pacific region. And so HMCS Montreal will be deploying into the uh, South Pacific region and around Australia as well. So even though they're based on one coast or another, we actually intermix when uh, the requirements is there. Um, for the second half of your question, it all depends how they're going to be operating. So if we want to maximize our endurance and uh, there's not a significant threat in the uh, region where they're operating, one of our frigates can easily do two weeks at sea on a diesel engine. They can maintain presence patrol. Uh, in storms or where there's a higher threat level, they have to be able to maneuver. And of course, a ship's not going to outmaneuver a missile. It's not going to outmaneuver a, tor a torpedo, or I should say, outrun it. Uh, however, they have to be able to turn quickly to be able to deal with it, to bring weapons to bear and everything else. And so if you're operating on gas turbines, generally about every four or five days, you want to find out where your tanker is because as soon as you're down a quarter tank of gas, the captain starts wondering, where's my next fuel stop? There's not a lot of uh, gas stations in the middle of the ocean. So so generally, I would say every every four to five days, uh, if you're in an operational theater, you're wondering where your fuel's coming from. But even in that situation, they can seven, eight days, no problem. So here we are on uh, December the 5th, uh, 2022, and we are next to HMCS Vancouver, and uh, next to her is HMCS Winnipeg. Uh, tell me about the significance of today. Well, the importance of today is we're welcoming back a whole bunch of our shipmates that have deployed to the Indo-Asian Pacific for the last six months, and so it's a very emotional day as Christmas is coming. Uh, the ministers here, we've had all kinds of uh, guest visitors in and around to welcome the ships home. And this is the other half of the departure. And so obviously uh, when you come home, it means you had to leave. Um, Canada maintaining a presence overseas and, and doing what our government wants means our ships can't stay here. They have to go to wherever they're needed. Uh, and in this case, it was uh, participating in part of RIMPAC earlier in the summer and then carrying on to the Indo-Asian Pacific, working with the Japanese, the Koreans, the the New Zealanders, the uh, Australians visiting Singapore, Malaysia, really making our presence uh, known and understood, and in some parts uh, transiting the Straits of Taiwan to uh, get from one place to another, uh, and working in the South China Sea or off the coast of North Korea to monitor UN sanctions that uh, are in place there. And so during those six months, a lot of work, a lot of focus, and today is sort of the release where we welcome back uh, about 500 of our shipmates that have been gone doing the business forward. And uh, we start prepping the ship for their next mission. Uh, how long is a typical turnaround time? It, it all depends. So HMCS Winnipeg is going to be doing domestic force generation for the next year or so. And uh, HMCS Vancouver, uh, over the next sort of six to nine months, will be going through maintenance and is uh, scheduled to deploy. Uh, specifics of that deployment are still being worked out, but it'll probably deploy next summer again. Awesome. Thanks very much, Commodore. Appreciate Absolutely. It. Have a great day. Thank you.
So, uh, hey everybody, welcome to Go Bold. I'm on board the, uh, the bridge of HMCS Ottawa, one of Canada's 12 Halifax-class surface combatant warships. Uh, and I am joined with Commander Sam Patchell, who's been a previous guest in one of the episodes of Go Bold. Uh, Commander, thank you so much for joining me again today. Okay, yeah, well, thank you for having me. Awesome. So, uh, the previous episodes of Go Bold, we've, we've showed the ship mm -hmm. uh, from the outside, from the undersurface, which was kind of a cool opportunity. Uh, and we've shown what it takes to get trained up. So we've gone to the simulators, we've right. gone to damage control. Now we're actually on board this ship and there's, there's so much here because not only is this a fighting warship, but it's also people's homes. So, um, there are so many things here that we can't cover in one small series, but um, this is a warship. And so we have to talk about the kind of combat capability of, right. of the Halifax class, uh, specifically HMCS Ottawa that you command. Mm -hmm. um, so if we were to talk about the ship and its capabilities and how you would actually fight the ship in a kinetic mm -hmm. uh, conflict, uh, how would that all happen? Well, my, you know, it's a somewhat broad question because it, it, so well, my first question would be, what, what's the enemy and where is it coming from? Is it, on the, is it on the surface of the ocean? Is it under the water or is it coming from the air? Right. Or a combination of all three, right. uh, which is what we train to, is to be able to fight in multiple domains or uh, at the same time. And there's a interconnectedness of the two because our modern uh, weapons and systems out there, our adversaries have weapons that uh, for example, a missile that can be launched from an aircraft, from a surface ship, or from a submarine. The, the, the final threat is an incoming missile, but it, the source of that threat could be, could be on land, it could be in the sea, it could be in the air. So uh, trying to, it's a fairly complex thing that uh, fighting, and, and, and as we work in a more coordinated fashion, so do our adversaries, where it isn't uh, the enemy that's shooting at me is not the one that's looking at me, that somebody else is potentially. So uh, try, working, fighting through that and identifying if uh, our, our multiple units working together to uh, defeat us if we were to get into a kinetic fight. Does that answer your question a bit? Yeah, yeah, okay. it, 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 it does. And I think contrary to what perhaps Hollywood often portrays, which is not typically not accurate, um, and maybe people's older ideas of what it's like to fight naval battles mm. or uh, fight a navy ship, you know, people might think you do it from the bridge um, where we currently are today, but that's not the case. It's not the case at all. And uh, the, the idea of being able to spot your target and engage, other than, uh, than a small boat where we're visually identifying the maneuvering, and you're engaging with our smaller weapon systems, uh, most of the enemies you're engaging, if it were in a kinetic fight, is over the horizon, or you can't see the submarine, uh, for example. So you're fighting, and that's why we move down. When we go to action stations, for example, I don't do that from up here. My eyes and ears are my bridge watchkeepers running, uh, usually led by the navigator on the bridge, and then we're fighting the systems down in the operations room as well, because there's as, it's as much the communications between units uh, so as it is identifying the target because there's a target that will if a target is identified that coordination between multiple units to actually if we are to put weapons on a target it, it likely is not in isolation particularly with warships right and so run me through a typical scenario let's say oh. uh, and again it, it depends on the context yeah. but let's say it's uh it lets uh, a hostile air target that, right. that you're encountering well, so that, that would be the first, the first indication. We're basically constantly monitoring the, the airspace around us and working with other units in a theater of operation monitoring that. And it's when we have uh, indications and warnings, possibly sent through intelligence or through an emitter uh, that we would detect that, or a call or an, uh, either another unit in our, in our group that detects that is contrary or outside the normal spectrum. And there's certain things we can identify. It's much like in the world of, in the airspace world, uh, there's a whole bunch of lanes. And airplanes, as you know, if you're flying from here to uh, say Japan, all the planes follow the same route. Well then if the, so if you're under that lane, you would expect most of the aircraft at a certain altitude uh, with a transponder on. Well, two aircraft come in low, much faster than any commercial air would. 
those are suspicious activities. Right. But that doesn't necessarily mean we need to go to action stations that are threatening us. Uh, so we would re likely reach out to them and try to establish some kind of communication because there could be all sorts of reasons why they may not be operating uh, as, as a normal aircraft would in that region. Mm -hmm. uh, but if, if there's n the, there aren't responses and they continue in a, in a threatening profile or they have emitters that would ind indicate that this is a potential threat, that's when we would then bring a ship to action stations to defend the ship, uh, not to because it's too late to wait till you've been shot at to defend the ship right. in many cases. So you bring the ship, it's easier to bring the ship to action stations, be ready to defend, and then realize, okay, and then identify, no, this, per, this, this aircraft wasn't a threat, and then we stand down and secure action stations as opposed to the alternative, right. uh, and to have to defend the ship in the short strokes where uh, the first indication that there's a threat is there's either a weapon release or a bomb toss or uh, the like. And then you're now you're playing playing catch up. Right, right. And so if you're sailing along on a normal, uh, on a typical day, doing right. doing whatever evolutions that you're doing, uh, and you go to action stations, it, typically you would be dressed in like the uniform that you are. Today. We're exactly. I'm wearing this rig. I'll be. I'll have a jacket on. We would be put on. We'd also put on our flash gear. It was learned actually back in uh, the Falkland War. The dam the injuries that are sustained when you take damage from monitors and fires and the flash damage. So protect your hands and face so we are, wear a flash hood um, to, to just protect ourselves. We, we're, we prepared ourselves to, to get into it. If we're in a fight, is to survive and continue the fight. Uh, we don't wanna, if, if something leaks through we, and we take a missile, uh, that we have a whole other organization when we go to action stations to now put out the fires, uh, put, you know, to, to stop the flooding and to continue to keep our weapons fighting and in, able to re-engage, uh, and also just the, our own health. So those, the protection head to toe from flash damage, uh, recognizing we may, be, we, we may have injuries, uh, but to then uh, fight around it. And so many of our systems throughout our ship, there's multiple redundancies and pathways in which the electrical signals go from one system to another so that we can toggle between them. If something was knocked out, there's a second, and that, that's true of and you'd expect to see that most warships nowadays. That's how we design them. So there isn't there isn't any one single point of failure. Right, right. Well, it, make, it makes total sense. Mm -hmm. And so throughout the bridge here, you'll see um, various different pieces of protective gear. Yes. That, that, that like you're referring to the flash gear, etc., cetera, etc. Yeah. Cetera. yeah, so. yeah. And the, those are the flak jackets, helmets, uh, Kevlar helmets. Uh, for those on the bridge where that are a higher risk as well, uh, if you're worrying about small boat attacks. Uh, with small arms uh, and and up here you're still protected, but uh, a 762 round your your AK-47 round if you're out on the wing it would be lethal. So wearing things like a Kevlar helmet does add that layer of protection. Also, just the shrapnel damage you, you may not be uh, near the direct impact of a, a rocket propelled grenade or a small arms fire, but the ricochet could still harm you. So that's why we wear the additional protective gear. Right um, for those people that are not familiar with the Navy, um, most of the weapon systems on board a Halifax class frigate are uh, defensive in nature. Is Affirmative, that, yeah, that, and that's, a, that's true. We're, we're not, uh, as a frigate, uh, really, uh, we're designed and our, our capabilities are limited to point defense or, and really self-defense, or uh, self-defense as long as the other uh, units nearby are within basically close enough that we'd likely have to, it's hard to discern whether we're under attack or the ship or the other unit near us is under attack. Uh, we do have a couple, our harpoon weapon system is a long, much longer range and is in, uh, and can be used uh, as an over or sorry, um, as not as a self-defense weapon and wouldn't consider it a self-defense weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, some may argue too, depending on how you look at our torpedoes, and the use of the torpedo. If a ship is firing a torpedo, uh, the traditional, the typical range of torpedoes, if you're firing at a submarine, you're firing in self-defense. Right. And that's why, uh, and actually, unfortunately, Ottawa has a helicopter embarked. And so the defense, the fighting particularly in the underwater warfare domain, uh, fighting, having helicopters, uh, are the potency and ability to uh, actually prosecute a submarine is much more capable when you have a helicopter. Right. Um, and that actually speaks to what I talked to you earlier about how you fight in the different domains. For a submarine, surface ships are the target, but it's the aircraft that are the real enemy, and that's what defeats them because they can 
they can move quickly, they can hover in the air and put their, their sensors right on top of the, and then, and, and no matter how fast, even the fastest submarines, they can't outrun it. So uh, you, you've got your nuclear powered submarines can go 30 knots, so that helicopter can go four times that speed. Oh, you're going that way, oh, I'll just reposition. Right. They can lay a bunch of uh, listening devices in the water, and then you know, I don't even need to know which way you're gonna go, you're gonna drive by one of them, and now, oh, you're over there. Uh, and then, and that's where you, that's where the potency that an aircraft has to defeat submarines is, is great. So. Right, right. And so every frigate, if you deploy, you typically deploy with yes. a helicopter. Oh yeah, uh, and for a multitude of reasons. Uh, the helicopter one to fight in the underwater warfare world uh, is a, just a force multiplier, but as well uh, building the surface picture. Uh, so as you can see, typically a ships can see to about 12 nautical miles on the horizon, there's simple math to figure out there's the curvature of the earth, the higher the mass, the further you can see. So, uh, and depending on the type of radar you have, but again, that's only to the surface. Well, all you need is a helicopter to go up a couple hundred feet. It's already seen further. And then it goes out, even if it doesn't go high, but it goes out far, it's now looking even beyond that and can then relay back, okay, a hundred miles from you is a surface ship that it might be a concern. Uh, we also know the, the the exact length of most ships out there. So similarly, when we come to identifying things, we're not sure it's this, but a tanker's typically, or say uh, a certain length. And then this ship is looks much different than that. I might not have a good optics on it, but I can see, well, sure doesn't look like a tanker right now. So that's a, and that's where a helicopter can tell me long before I'm even near that ship. We go, okay, we made it. So heads up, maybe we should uh, you know, not come to action stations just yet but uh, focus the team looking down that do we have other indications are there are they uh, emitting uh, a certain frequencies most of us have some kind of navigation radar which every every ship in the world tends to have mm -hmm. but there's some more if you look at Winnipeg and ahead of us here same with uh, with Ottawa uh, and all warships they they operate in a full a whole myriad of spectrum of electronic systems that uh, uh, basically transmit into the electronic spectrum which is not normal from your def your typical merchant. Right, right. So if you now, uh, if you get to the point where a threat is, you know, you're, you're now deeming it, uh, uh, whatever situation you've got, there's mm -hmm. a threat, you go to action stations. Is, is it you as the captain that makes that decision to go to action stations? Well, yes and no. Uh, I've empowered my team. Actually, there's a great scene. Uh, have you seen the movie Master and Commander? Yes. Okay, yes. right. The opening scenes. Yeah. The young ensign, and and the and the other one who just looking down just for a sec. He thought he saw something, and he, he isn't sure. And then the other one says, oh, "Beat a quarters and and, and bring the ship." That's basically bring the ship to action stations. Right. So similarly, the first in the either in the operations room, or up here on the bridge, there may be just a, a sniff of something that, uh oh, something's happening, uh, and we don't have time to talk. And figure it out and talk it through was it this and start to overthink it we have a, a series of that's a clue that this might be a threat we'll bring the ship to action and, and and i've empowered my my watch keepers and my operations room officers bring the ship to take action and this is one thing you know, it, it's it's always like a lot of things I, you'll never be faulted for bringing the ship to action stations one too many times you will be faulted if one not enough right, right? Right. Uh, and oh, oh darn! And uh, so we we close it, wakes people up, gets people moving. We get our gear in place, and it was you know, and not to say a false alarm, but okay now. But it, so now things are happening. We still got to figure out is this a real threat or not until the team is really ready to go and fully defend ourselves. We're immediately if we're in a high threat environment, instantly the the systems are already set up such that that urgent reaction. Uh, we're ready to go. We'll have the weapon systems and the team dialed in where certain stuff is ready to defend. We, ha we have to fight against systems that fire from detection inside 30 seconds from detection to impact. Uh, so you ne we need to be able to know, heads up, there's something going. You can bring the ship, we got six minutes, we'll have the ship at action stations. It's already, that weapon has already come in and we've already had to defeat it. So there are already systems in place for that. Mm -hmm. um, that's also a clue that we're under attack. Right. Uh, so that our posture would change. So. Um, I'd say that would be where it's not just me that makes the call. I might have just, all I have is more experience. Right. As I'm like, all right. And, and people sometimes are reluctant to make the call because they're worried about, actually great, that again in that movie where the, I think the, the kid had 
struggled, where he was struggling, people were doubting, and he had the right instincts, but he didn't know how to act. Uh, so I tried my best to empower that I trust it. Yeah, I yeah, made the call based on what information he had. If it was the wrong call, hindsight's great. Okay, now we know more, but uh, reacting and getting, bring the ship, getting people moving. Uh, so be it if it was a, a false alarm. I'd rather false alarm than have not react to the real thing. So. Absolutely, and that's part of what we've seen over the course of this series, is that all of the training, it's all building blocks, getting to the point where you deploy, yeah, and everyone kind of knows when something happens that this yeah. is how you react, this is what you need to do. Um, you, so, you think that would be, that's definitely where, uh, it's, 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 it's the relationship you build. I remember you asked me earlier about how how is it that you, you know, understand the trust or how, how officers know uh, what you want? And uh, it's actually every day working together, building a trust. And, and when you really get a team working well together, you almost have to say nothing. It's a look. They'll give a report and there's a look, a tone, a nod, a gesture, and it just takes down the verbology. Maybe not properly recorded, but that you only build that when you work together as a team. Uh, and when done well, it's amazing actually how quiet things get, uh, and the teams, uh, the trying to explain to each other why I've come up. No, no, I, I know you got it. I know what you're talking about because I'm right here working with you, and you're you're briefing me. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Go right. That kind of is very quiet, and, and it gives actually a lot of space. And it's only when you you are working together and it's a new team uh, that hasn't practiced. That that's when you start to see some struggles. But fortunately, I've been with this team now. I just signed a piece of paper today reminding me I've been here uh, for 38 months. So I've been here a while, which is a long <laughs> you time. Have, yeah. Uh, so uh, I've got to know this team well. Uh, and, and my my job really is just to make them all be a bit better at their jobs. Because uh, and uh, and and that's how I. My hope is that we'll do well. Uh, that's that's my job. Uh, and I, I think they are so. Uh, from everything I've seen, Commander, I think you know that that will that will be the case. You guys just seem to be a very, very you know, uh, fine knit working unit. Uh, when you go to action stations, uh, right. you go from here now uh, to the ops room. Yeah, if I happen to be on the bridge, I would be. I'd go from here, but I could easily be uh, in the bathroom, working out in the gym, uh, going for a walk. I like going into the engine room a lot, so uh, I'm always walking about the ship. Uh, and if they can't get a hold of me, then we might be. So to, let's presume that today I happen to be on the bridge and we got the clue uh, that there, there's something, and then we bring the ship to action stations. At that point, I'd be moving down to ops. Okay, perfect. So let's go to ops and take okay. a look at what that entails. All right. Uh, perfect. Thank you, Pamela. Oh, no problem. Yeah. Sign something, eh? <laughs> I took my pen out of my pocket. So I wouldn't have it in my shirt. Oh, okay. So we'll go down here. There. So we'll just keep going down, and then I've got to come back up for a sec. Okay. Sure. Are we good to come in? Yes, sir. Perfect. Come on in. So we've just arrived in the Ops Center on board HMCS uh, Ottawa, and I'm here with the Commander Patchell again. So, Commander, uh, you, we just came down from the bridge, yeah. and if you were at action stations, you'd come into this space. Exactly. Like I said, we, we put on some extra protective gear and then making our way in here. Uh, I'd move in here. Uh, at the time, you'd see a lot more displays up and running. Uh, I immediately, my operations room officer, the one running really this entire team, uh, who knows the is in the fight, uh, is sitting right there. My first move is just to step in behind him. Okay, where's the threat? Uh, and my second glance, actually, Grant, if you, I look right where he is, just behind him. There's a heading. I'm gonna look at my heading and, uh, and I'm just looking at that to glance and sort of put him. I don't know where I just came from. In this case, the bridge. I, I knew where we were going, but I'd look at where we're headed and, and where we need to go and, and just try to orient myself fairly quickly, what's going on around. Uh, if it was in the air war, mm -hmm. uh, it was something we talked about earlier, if an aircraft came inbound, so that's this guy, this gentleman or, 
a lady here in this case, uh, two gentlemen that work on our team, leading a team of men and women on the left side of the ship fighting the surface and air war. And so I'd be focusing more on listening to what they had to say at that moment. Uh, as you can see, this is also, and we talked earlier about this is both our, our office space and our home. So some of the uh, extra, you know, like the Mr. Bejado heads on the front and the uh, decorations here are uh, just, that's, I think that's sailors awesome. being sailors. Yeah, it's oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't really have a tactical, element, but that would be where we'd focus. If it was on the, on the underwater war, uh, that's this team. There'd be a whole team of people here working, operating these systems and the expert, the one leading that is there. If it's at the surface world again, partly there, but also here in the front row, as they base it, they're really managing all the radar information that's coming in. And it, I guess it's a simply, it's just, it's a bunch of data fusion mm -hmm. that comes together to one position here, that that person then, as much as the computers are great, they do a lot of uh, calculations and figure thing out, by the end of the day, it takes a human to kind of, to crunch it all and realize, yeah, that's right or that's wrong, sort through that and then put it into that is an enemy or that is a friendly target and, and so forth. So. Right, right. So underwater is yep. kind of that that part of the ops room, uh, surface, uh, sorry, air. So surf, so really surface and air, the mm -hmm. weapon systems is here. Mm -hmm. the, the, the plotting of um, aircraft, surface ships, subsurface ships kind of that's the easy way to, to look at it. Okay. So kind of from those in the air, the overall picture and those uh, underwater, mm -hmm. and then all the tactics and the other specialized equipment work it to fighting that work here. So that's kind of how we've divided. Most ships out there, that's how you co-locate the people working in the, in the same, uh, fighting the same domain. Right, right. And so you have a number of, of kinetic weapons that are yes. that are available, as we mentioned, primarily for defensive purposes. Mm -hmm. um, you have evolved Sea Sparrow missiles. Yep. And those are surface to air. Yes. Uh, you've got torpedoes, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the Harpoon uh, anti-ship missile. Yep. And then you have the main gun. Primarily, those are the yes. The, uh, the, the, main, the gun. main gun, so which can fire to surface targets or air targets. Mm -hmm. As well, we have a close-in weapon system. It's the system aft that looks like a R2. D2 with a Gatling gun on it, right? And that's really, uh, and that's a last defense uh, point defense system, as well. We have some uh, because of advanced weaponry. We also work with a bunch of uh, systems that don't go for hard kill but soft kill, and to seduce and distract the weapons with active seeker heads from hitting us and working together. Right, so. right. And I guess the the final kind of um, I guess uh, little point defense weaponry is. Uh, some of the remote weapon stations that you have around the, yes. around the ship. Yes, so if we came in close, we do also have five uh, 50 caliber mounts that are remotely controlled from down inside the ship. Mm -hmm. And those are, it, it does two things. One, uh, protects the operator so they're no longer exposed on the upper decks. Mm -hmm. And two, uh, being gyroscopically stabilized and, and remotely controlled, there's a handoff ability between them. So as a target maneuvers or the ship maneuvers, we, the operator can go, can transfer from one weapon to the other and continuously fire if required, just because, so that it, it, the firing arc of each weapon is then covered uh, and the person doesn't lose control. Well, Commander Patchell, I, I can't thank you enough for, for sh sh explaining how you would fight a Halifax-class warship and also for allowing us to come into this space. It's a very rare opportunity I don't think many get, so um, I want to just thank you so uh, much for... You're welcome, Jody. For, for taking the time. Cheers. Gr great great yeah. to see you. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Uh, I am on board the Folksole of HMCS Ottawa, one of Canada's 12 Halifax-class frigates, and I'm joined by Lieutenant Graham Stout. Uh, Graham, thank you so much for joining me on Go Bold. Oh, thank you very much for having me, Jody. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's wonderful to have you on this episode. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Graham, tell me a little bit about your position aboard. Uh, so, on board HMCS Ottawa, I am the Combat Systems Engineering Officer, Assistant Head of Department. So, what does that mean? My department is responsible for the maintenance of all the weapons and sensors on board uh, this frigate. So, we are stocked with technicians. Those technicians perform all the maintenance and all the repairs so that when the operators need to use these weapons and sensors, they operate as expected. Um, so my boss on board is the head of department. So he is ultimately responsible 
for the entire department. Uh, I am currently training right now. I'm the assistant head of department, uh, preparing for my next tour where I will be the uh, one in charge. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, for this particular episode, we had the opportunity to speak with your commanding officer, uh, Commander Sam Patchell, and he described to us what it takes or what happens when a ship comes to action stations. And if you happen to get into a kinetic fight, um, he describes some of the weapons that are aboard. And so you're, you and your department, in, or the people in your department, are instrumental in keeping these things working properly. Yeah, that's the, correct. The way they're advertised. Um, so how about we walk through the weapons from, from fore to aft, and, uh, and you can just describe to me as we go what each one does and kind of a little bit about each one, if that's Perfect, okay. yeah, I'd, I'd be very happy to do that. Awesome, so let's start with this one, the, the most obvious. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, behind us here, we have our 57 millimeter Bofors main gun armament. Uh, this is gonna be used for both offensive and de defensive capabilities against surface and air threats. Uh, so primarily, we're going to employ it in a defensive capability against uh, incoming uh, missiles or other projectiles, uh, but it can also be used offensively against surface targets as a deterrent for them closing our position. Um, and, and this gun uh, is fed in from all the sensors that you can see above here on the mast. Uh, as is probably very obvious, um, a human trying to aim this gun at the right point in space uh, quickly enough to uh, intercept a threat is borderline impossible uh, at this level of technology in this day of age. Uh, so this gun relies on all that information being fed in so it can point at the right spot and hit the target at the right time. Wow, very, very cool. Uh, I see another one further in the back. Let's go take a look yeah, at Yeah, let's uh, go over here. So yeah, as you can see up on the bridge wing there, uh, that's our Naval Remote Weapon System. Uh, it's an upgrade of our standard 50 caliber uh, mount. So that gun right there, uh, 50 caliber, um, and what we've done is we've basically turned everything from a manual sailor standing out there firing the gun uh, out in the elements, and we've electronic, uh, made it all uh, electrical and electronic. So now the operator sits in the safety of the ship and is able to actuate that through a joystick and a screen. And uh, we've been trialing it in the past couple months and we found the accuracy has actually increased quite a bit. So it's, it's a great upgrade to the fleet and we've been able to use it with a quite amount of success. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how it's gonna operate uh, when we go on deployment and how it's going to hold up um, in the threat areas on, you know, across the Pacific. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting kind of evolution of that weapon because before you would happen to have, you would have to have people out there operating it and that puts them at risk. And so now it's, it's remotely operated. You can be in the safety of being inside the ship Yep. while operating that. That's correct, yes. Yeah. And yeah, also the person standing out there would have to have communications on, uh, it's really loud and everything like that. Now, inside the ship, almost no noise at all. Like the communication's better, uh, everything's better. Uh, I'm really happy with this, uh, this upgrade to the system. Beautiful. Well, let's continue on back. Yes, and, please. Uh, and we'll go to the next weapon. Foot there. Would you like port or starboard, whichever uh, the light is better? Uh, how about we uh, stay on this side yeah, and we'll totally. just work our way back?
All right, so just behind me here, we have our evolved Sea Sparrow missile. Uh, these are primarily our self-defense missiles on board. Um, so we're gonna employ them when we have an incoming missile threat or an incoming aircraft, and we're gonna launch these out to intercept it. Um, as with the 57 millimeter up front, uh, these missiles will be getting their information from the various sensors on board and we'll be feeding that target information in so we can be sure that this missile is going to get to the right spot and impact, impact the target at the right time. Right, and there's eight missiles on this side of the ship and an equal number on the opposite side. That is correct. Right. And yeah, you can see we have the missile canister itself and then we have the exhaust tube because when that thing launches, it's gonna put a lot of uh, material out the bottom of it. Right on, excellent. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, we'll go on to the Moving next. on. I'm not sure what the best angle, are you able to see here? For, okay, perfect. Uh, just behind me here, we have our Harpoon missiles. So these are our uh, over the horizon, surface to surface missiles. So we're gonna employ these in a primarily offensive capability um, against hostile targets, whether they be on the ocean or on the shore. Right, and so this particular missile is in essence an anti-ship missile. That is correct, yes. Right. And uh, yeah, this is very standard uh, offensive missile. Uh, many navies across the world uh, carry the Harpoon missile right. for their offensive and, capabilities. And so four on this side of the ship and four on the other side. That is correct. And you can see the orientation of the missiles here. So these missiles are going to fire that way and go out the other side of the ship. The opposite side. Yeah, uh, from, that's correct. From what they're loaded. Excellent. Okay. Perfect. And we'll go on to the next one. Moving on back. So you can see right here, coming off the side of the ship, we have two torpedo tubes. Uh, so Halifax class frigates carry a complement of torpedoes on board. Uh, we primarily, the ship itself primarily uses these in a defensive capability. So if we have any subsurface threats that are getting too close to us, uh, we're gonna utilize these torpedoes to engage them directly, or at least put something into the water to make them think twice about coming closer to us. Right. Um, so two tubes here on the starboard side, and there's also two over on, oh, correction, two here on the port side, and two over there on the starboard side. On the starboard side, excellent, awesome. And uh, I guess we'll just continue yeah, on. Yeah, let's right continue to the back. on back. Yeah. So yeah, now we find ourselves out here on the flight deck. So currently uh, our Halifax class frigates employ the Cyclone helicopter. Um, so that's gonna sit in the hangar here and then it's gonna traverse out here onto the flight deck to take off and land. Uh, one of the big capabilities we have with our Cyclone helicopters is the ability to employ our torpedoes. Um, so that turns our primarily defensive capability into a more offensive capability because now we can load those torpedoes up onto the helicopter. The helicopter can fly out um, over the horizon and uh, if we're lucky, can drop those torpedoes directly down on top of the, their target. Right. And that way we're able to uh, project force a little bit further and keep, uh, keep those forces far away from the ship that we're not putting ourselves in danger. So that, I mean, that's a way that we're really integrating both uh, maritime and air together to make a more complete package. Right. And at the very stern of the ship, there are some more of the remote weapon stations? That is correct. So you can see there, they're just covered in covers right now to protect them from the elements. But we have two more back here. So we had one on each bridge wing up front and then we have one on each uh, quarter deck back here. So that's the exact same Naval Remote Weapon System. Uh, it's gonna be operated by the same people. Uh, they're all gonna sit together 
uh, down in the station control room, for lack of a better word. Um, and yeah, gonna actuate them. And so now we are, we're sort of spreading our arcs of fire, right? So we have up at the front covered off, and now we have back here at the stern covered off, and we're getting more of a complete envelope of uh, protecting the ship. Right. And the only other thing that the commanding officer spoke to were some of the decoys that are also available to the ship. Uh, they are not kinetic weapons, but they are helpful in, in fighting the ship. That is um, correct. Are you able to speak a little bit about those, like in terms of like uh, just generally what they do? Sure, I'd love to. So yeah, on board we have our um, air launch decoys. Uh, so the thing you have to understand about missiles is uh, missiles in general aren't really looking for IR energy. Uh, it's not like your eyeball. They're looking for radar cross-section. So they're gonna put out some RF energy and they're gonna get a receive back. Um, when they put out a radio signal and it hits our ship and reflects back, that's gonna have you know, it's basically to tell them the missile, that's exactly where HMCS Ottawa is. So what these uh, chaff systems do is they're gonna put up a whole bunch of material into the air. And basically, if the missile is trying to look for us, they're gonna focus on the biggest thing that they can see. If the biggest thing that they can see is a big ball of chaff, they're gonna go for that and not go for us. So, um, those systems are like really going to protect us, uh, especially when we have forces coming in really close. Um, and yeah, they like certainly cannot be overlooked. Yeah, very important. And it's kind of a, 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 a good way to segue to the last weapon system, which those that know might think we've forgotten, but it actually speaks to what we just spoke about, the chaff and hopefully enemy missiles will go towards that. But in case they don't, there's a last point of defense, and that's the weapon system up top. Yeah, so we have our uh, Phalanx close-in weapon system, uh, colloquially known as the Sea Wiz. Uh, so yes, this is our last line of defense against incoming threats. Um, basically, the point of the Sea Wiz is to put as much lead between us and the threat as possible. Um, if you've ever seen any of these in action, uh, very loud, very fast, um, basically universally used across uh, many navies across the world. Um, but yeah, primarily for uh, air targets, uh, can be utilized against surface targets, but I mean, mostly we're just gonna let the Sea Wiz pick up its target and do its thing. Right, and, and it does it automatically, right? That's correct, yes. So uh, the Sea Wiz, you can see the radome up there. It has its own sensors that it's going to be going off of. Uh, the Sea Wiz will 100% do its own thing and take care of itself. And by extension, it's gonna take care of us. Awesome. Well, Lieutenant Stout, thank you so much for uh, giving us a tour of the weapon systems on board HMCS Ottawa. It's been <laughs> wonderful to have you here. Hey, thank you very much, Jody. Really happy to do it. And yeah, you're welcome back on board HMCS Ottawa anytime. Thank you, sir. You're and so I, I wish you all the best of luck on your upcoming deployment. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.